On Saturday, November 20th, 1971, a group of students and instructors boarded a ski lift at the base of Mount Cairngorm in the Scottish Highlands. Little did they know, something terrifying was waiting for them at the top. This is the 1971 Cairngorm Plateau disaster. On Saturday, November 20th, 1971, Sergeant John Duff was visiting friends on a freezing night in the Scottish Highlands. The plan was to eat a bit of food, warm themselves by the fire, and spend the night talking and enjoying each other's company. As the night went on, there was even a talk of a bit of whiskey, but in the back of his mind, John knew he had to say no. Such a stormy night with strong winds and snow meant it was possible that someone might have gotten into trouble in the Highlands, and since John was the leader of a local mountain rescue team, finding them would be his job. And soon enough, this instinct proved to be right. At midnight, two of his colleagues knocked on the door to tell him that a group of school children had gone missing in the blizzard. The next morning, John organized a search and rescue and headed out to help with the effort. But despite the efforts of 50 men and as many helicopters as were free, they couldn't find anyone. On Monday morning at about 10.30 a.m., John's radio crackled and a message came through. It was a bad signal, but he could just make out what was being said. One of the helicopters had found someone crawling on her hands and knees through the snow, and when they reached her, she managed to whisper just a few words before collapsing from exhaustion. The mountains that John's team had been searching were the Cairngorms, which are located in the Scottish Highlands, just north of the capital city of Edinburgh. What makes this area especially popular with hikers and climbers is the 1,200-meter or 4,300-foot granite plateau that extends from the mountain Cairngorm all the way to the second highest peak in the British Isles, known as Ben Macdui. The steep edges of this plateau are popular for climbing and skiing, and at the same time, the breathtaking scenery attracts hikers to the trails that crisscross the range. Some of these are easy enough for casual hikers, while others, like the plateau itself, can be a challenge even for experienced mountaineers. Part of the reason for this is that the plateau is quite cold. There's not much vegetation besides some moss and some grasses, and it's even technically considered to have a subarctic climate. What makes it even more dangerous, though, is that the weather can change in an instant. One moment you'll be walking in sunshine, and then a few minutes later, high winds and snow can cause blizzards and whiteouts. In fact, wind speeds of up to 170 miles per hour have been recorded there. Even people who have traversed the Antarctic and climbed in the Himalayas have said that the Cairngorm Plateau can be as dangerous as some of the more extreme parts of the world. The locals have long known about these sudden weather changes and have been finding ways to cope with them for centuries. Across the Scottish Highlands, you can find what is known as a bothy. These are small stone buildings originally built for farm workers, but nowadays they mainly provide shelter for anybody walking the highlands who might want to escape the wind, rain, and snow. Some people even take trips to the bigger and better known bothies as part of a vacation. Most of these shelters have an area inside them to make a fire and a chimney on the roof. Some have basic cooking equipment and occasionally you'll find tins of food left by other visitors. But for the most part, these are usually just tiny rooms with a stone floor to sleep on and little more than a shovel for digging out the snow or creating a makeshift bathroom. The Cairngorm Plateau has a series of these shelters along its route, and one of the highest is known as Curan Bothy. It's just a small building that's 4 meters by 2 meters, but it does have a chimney for a fire and is also closest to the highest standing lake in the British Isles, so finding drinking water is less of an issue than at some of the other shelters. It also happens to be made from metal rather than stone, making it sturdier. It's also often used as a last resort by hikers crossing the plateau, which always worried some more experienced mountaineers. The thought was that hikers with less experience might use it as an emergency backup for a hike that they really shouldn't have been doing in the first place. In 1968, an unused patch of land to the north of the Cairngorms, known as Laganlia, was turned into an outdoor center and opened to the public in 1970. To this day, over 4,500 kids from 40 different Edinburgh schools visit Laganlia every year to try everything from boating to winter climbing, but in its early days, the center mostly focused on hikes throughout the surrounding mountains. About a year after it opened, a group of 14 children from the outskirts of Edinburgh arrived at the centre ready for adventure. One of the teachers from the school, Ben Beatty, who also ran their mountaineering club, had organised a two-day hike through the Cairngorm Plateau. Ben was popular with the staff and kids because he was outgoing and easy to get along with, and he was also just sort of a natural leader. Every Friday, he took some of the club's members to camp, walk, and explore the wilderness, but in November of 1970, he wanted to do something more ambitious. Critically though, although he was an experienced mountaineer, he hadn't yet walked the Cairngorm Plateau in winter. His girlfriend Catherine, on the other hand, did have experience. She'd been walking the hills since she was just 14 years old and began climbing at 16. 
She also had advanced qualifications from the Scottish Mountaineering Club, and with three winter hikes over the plateau under her belt, she was the perfect person to help Ben with the trip. He suggested to the school and the center that he take her along, and they both thought it was a good idea. Then, needing a third pair of hands, they also took an 18-year-old trainee instructor from the outdoor center named Sheila. Above everything, they had to make sure that the children were safe on the trip, so the center loaned them mountaineering equipment, and at the same time, the school made sure they had all the right clothes for the cold conditions. Then, in addition to all their equipment, they got training from Ben on essential mountaineering skills, like how to use a compass to find your way, even in a whiteout. In preparation for the trek, it became clear that six of the group members weren't as capable as the rest of the party due to a lack of experience on hikes, which gained so much elevation. Because of this, the initial plan for everyone to spend a couple days on the top of the plateau together wouldn't work. So, instead, they decided to split the teenagers into two groups. Those who had been out with Ben before a few times and had some experience would go with him, and the six who were less experienced would join Catherine and Sheila on a more straightforward route. The idea was for both groups to follow the same route on day one, and the experienced group would set the pace while the less experienced group followed in behind. They'd start by climbing up the road to the restaurant at the top of Cairn Gorm to eat and prepare for the long trek ahead. Then at midday, they'd set off from the restaurant parking lot, following the plateau past the small but beautiful Lake Lokan Bidi, and then up Ben Macdui at the other end. Once they'd done that, they'd descend following a shallow stream until they reached Kuru Bothi, which is another shelter on the mountain pass beneath the plateau. Then, after spending the night and having a little breakfast, the inexperienced group would follow the plateau back right away. Meanwhile, since the experienced group was faster, they'd first head off to climb Britain's third and fourth highest peaks before following the plateau back as well. Finally, at 4.30pm, they'd all meet up at an old metal bridge near the foot of Cairngorm, ready for the transport back to the outdoor centre. The instructors figured that by splitting the groups up, they would ensure that no one found it too difficult and they could keep each group safer, but they came up with a plan B anyway because they knew how dangerous the Cairngorms could be. If the weather got bad, both teams would skip the climb of Ben McDewey, head for the small Curran shelter at the top of the plateau, and hunker down until things got better. Once the weather improved, they'd go down the lower pass and make their way back together. Once the plan was finalized, the head of the outdoor center was okay with it as well, so we signed off on the plan and the instructors prepared to take the excited teenagers on the adventure of a lifetime. On the morning they planned to leave, they checked the weather forecast and there didn't seem to be anything too extreme for that time of the year on the horizon, and certainly nothing bad enough to cancel the trip over. However, what they didn't realize, or perhaps mistook for usual winter conditions, was that a cold northwesterly stream of air had been blowing across most of Scotland that week. Many of the high roads in the area were already impassable, and even some of the lower roads were becoming blocked by snow. And this snow had an impact on the two teams almost straight away. They realized that they couldn't use the road to reach the restaurant at Cairngorm, and instead had to take a ski lift to the top. This also meant that they'd set off up the mountain a little later than they hoped, not reaching the restaurant until after they planned to start walking across the plateau already. Once they were finally at the top, the teams tried to get back on schedule by quickly eating their lunches before setting off, but they still ended up starting their hike a little after 1pm. As planned, the experienced group went first, followed by the less experienced group about 20 minutes later, but then almost immediately, the weather got much more severe. The experienced group had only covered just over a mile in the snow when strong winds hit them. These gusts whipped up the snow, causing blizzard-like conditions and a total whiteout. No one could see more than a few meters in front of their face, and it became obvious that they had to go to Plan B right away. They followed their training and attached a rope to Ben, and he followed his compass straight towards the Curran shelter with the teenagers in tow behind. It was a long and challenging trek, but by 3.30pm they found the shelter. When they reached it, and in just the span of a couple hours, the weather had been so bad that the entrance to the shelter was completely blocked by snow. After digging it out, they made their way inside and huddled together for warmth, and by then, their clothes were wet and stick into the cold shelter walls, which was uncomfortable, but it was still far better than being stranded outside. As they huddled together inside, they assumed that the other group had found one of the shelters along the pass and were waiting out the storm there. The next day, they woke up ready to make their way back, but when they dug out the shelter, they found that the weather hadn't improved much, if at all. As they got colder and hungrier, they decided it was probably better to try to make it back, rather than staying there and risking hypothermia. They knew they couldn't head back the way they came, so the first step was to get back down to a safer pass. Unfortunately, this meant putting out ropes and rappelling it down these steep plateau edges. Thankfully, all of Ben's training paid off. He fitted the teenagers with crampons to improve their grip and then helped them descend one by one. But then as it got colder, they got weaker and the rope became more slippery as time passed. Then at one point, one of the boys lost his footing and began to slide. If it hadn't been for Ben quickly reaching out to him, he might have fallen to the valley below. He would make it safely down to the ground, but this scared some of the others, and one of the last to go almost couldn't do it. 
On the way down, he froze in terror and burst into tears halfway down the plateau edge. Ben eventually had to talk him down one step at a time, but thankfully he would make it down. Once they'd all safely reached the lower mountain pass, things were a little better, but not much. The walk back was so grueling that Ben had to carry the pack of an exhausted boy or he wouldn't have been able to keep going. Painstakingly and very slowly, they made their way back until they found a shelter with a radio in it, at which point Ben called ahead to let everybody know what happened. At 5.30pm that afternoon, the experienced party reached the rendezvous bridge only to find that the others weren't back yet. Ben checked the restaurant parking lot, the restaurant, and then the outdoor center, but there was no sign of them. Right away, this was alarming because they were way behind the experience group when they set off. If they'd made it to a nearby shelter, they should have been back long before them. So as soon as he was sure they were nowhere to be found, he immediately called for help. A little over a day before, Catherine's last experience party had set off 20 minutes after the experience party. Sometime later, they were spotted from the base of the plateau heading directly toward the storm clouds. As the snowstorm hit, they decided to drop lower in the valley, but unfortunately, despite descending, they were still in whiteout conditions, making it almost impossible to see where they were going. They continued on until they met a small river, also known as a burn, that came down from Lokan Bidi, which is the lake close to the Kuran shelter. They hoped to follow this up and then locate the shelter, but by the time they found the river, the snow was falling harder than it had been at the top of the plateau. This meant that the frozen stream was completely covered and too difficult to follow. With no other options and convinced that there was no way they could find any of the shelters in the storm, they decided to bivouac where they were in a spot known as Fei Budi. Tragically, they had no idea that they couldn't have picked a worse place to bivouac or that they were just a few hundred meters from the Kuran Bothy. A bivouac is a temporary camp often used in emergencies where people use their sleeping bags and whatever they can find in the surrounding environment for protection. They knew this was a last resort, but they didn't think they had any other choice. First, they tried to build shelters out of the snow, but it was too powdery to make anything they felt safe sleeping under. So instead, they tried to build a snow wall to protect them from the worst of the wind. The most important thing was to try to stay as warm as possible. Unfortunately, by then as well, most of their clothing was soaked, which only made them cool down more quickly. To combat this, the group took off their wet clothes, climbed inside their dry sleeping bags, and huddled together as best they could. Once they were dry and tucked in, they tried to keep their spirits up by talking and singing, but snow tends to collect in the spot they chose to bivouac, and as the storm got more intense, they kept getting buried. It didn't take long before only one of the boys' heads was visible above the canopy. The initially optimistic singing slowly turned to panic, and Catherine spent most of the night digging everyone out of the snowdrifts with her bare hands. At some point, she even lost her gloves as she frantically tried to keep their heads above the surface. Despite her best efforts, when daylight came, she could hear shouting from beneath the snow from one of the boys. By the time she'd freed him, another one of the students had already become half buried. To make things worse, by morning, the trainee instructor Sheila and another girl were in a daze, unsure of where they were or what was happening due to their worsening hypothermia. With hypothermia as well, initially, as you get cold, the vessels in your extremities constrict to keep blood in your body to preserve your core body temperature. But in an extreme case of hypothermia, these blood vessels can suddenly dilate, and this rush of blood can make your extremities feel like they're burning up all of a sudden and lead to something called paradoxical undressing. As a result, many victims of hypothermia have been found outside their tents or even without clothing. And Catherine was horrified to find two girls lying outside of their sleeping bags on top of the snow. Immediately, she ran over to them and got help from a student named William to get them back in their sleeping bags. But with the situation completely out of control now, even though Catherine was exhausted, she decided she would need to at least try to get help. She and William set off into the storm but were almost immediately turned back by the snow and strong winds. Soon enough, they were back with the others, huddled together and hoping the storm would improve soon. Unfortunately, the blizzard continued all day Sunday. As the sun set that day, they thought they could see flares off in the distance. They had some mini flares with them, which they might have been able to use to signal back, but in the chaos and all of the snow, they weren't able to find them. Instead, they screamed as loud as possible to make themselves heard, but they were too far away for anyone to hear them. As the night drew on, the snow fell even harder and buried them even more. The following morning, almost everyone in the party had been covered by the snowstorm. Voices could be heard shouting from below somewhere in the snow, but as time went on, the voices became quieter. Catherine and William tried to set off for help again, but William collapsed almost right away from exhaustion. In complete desperation, she knew she had to keep going, so she resorted to crawling on her hands and knees. A day earlier, as soon as Ben reported the less experienced party missing, three teams set off to see if they could find them in the most likely spots. They spent 20 hours in the darkness and below freezing blizzard, setting off flares and checking any shelter they could reach. These were the flares the missing group had seen but couldn't do anything about. 
While this initial search was underway, the local police tracked down John Duff, who quickly organized more than 50 people, including police, soldiers, and experienced mountaineers to take part in the search. He knew air support was essential if they wanted to find them quickly, so he also enlisted helicopters from the local Royal Air Force bases. On Sunday morning, the volunteer pilots got together to become familiar with local maps and the weather forecasts. Initially, flying in the blizzard was impossible, so it wasn't until 7 o'clock Monday morning that they could get airborne. Most of the time, they couldn't get much beyond an airspeed of 90 knots, with headwinds reducing them to a walking pace at ground level. To make matters even more complicated, the features they'd found on the maps to aid their navigation were covered by deep snow. Then, upon entering the first couple of valleys, low-level clouds made spotting anything almost impossible. It was extremely difficult, but they pressed on, and eventually one of the helicopters made it to the Curran shelter. They quickly checked it in case any of the less experienced group had made it, but there were no signs of anyone, so they turned back. Then, almost as soon as they turned around, one of the crew spotted what looked like a small red tent in the snow. The pilot turned and tried to get closer, and as he got near, the tent stood up and began to wave at them. They'd just found Catherine crawling along the ground. The pilot tried to land the helicopter as close to her as possible, but whenever he got too low, his rotors kicked up so much soft snow that it completely blinded him. Eventually, he managed to land in a spot where the snow wasn't as deep, and two members jumped out of the helicopter. Unfortunately though, when they got to her, she was so exhausted and frozen that her legs had locked in a kneeling position. In the deep snow, it was almost impossible to carry her back to the helicopter, so the pilot tried to move closer, but again, he couldn't get to them without blinding himself. The only remaining option was for the final crew member to drop out of the hatch with the helicopter's winch in tow and use it to help guide the pilot directly to Catherine. The helicopter rocked back and forth in the wind, but Wood managed to get the front wheel on the ground and the hatch at shoulder height. Finally, after getting her safely on board, the pilot returned to the original drop-off point to pick up the other two crew members. By the time they found her, she was suffering from severe hypothermia and her gloveless hands were badly frostbitten. They asked her where the rest of the group was, but Catherine was so delirious and exhausted that she only managed to get out three words, which were Faye Boudet, Buried, and Burn. Thankfully, this was enough to let the rescue mission know where the rest of the party was, which was then radioed to the rest of the rescuers. Once John found out about what Catherine said, he sent out another helicopter to the top of the river to see if he could find the missing party from the air. By then, cloud cover had dropped so low and the wind had become so fierce that it was too dangerous again to approach by air. One of the helicopters that tried was even caught in a downdraft that flung them toward the ground. Thankfully, the pilot managed to regain control, but it was clear that they'd have to get to the missing kids on foot. The first person to reach the students was Ben and two of his colleagues, soon followed by John and a doctor. As they frantically dug into the snow, hoping to find signs of life, they were met with six lifeless sleeping bags. In them were five of the students and the instructor trainee, Sheila. The seventh and final dig was to free someone in the middle of the group, a boy named Raymond. While they were uncovering him, one of the rescuers saw his hand move. They immediately stopped and checked and found that somehow he was still breathing. They started digging even more frantically and then the doctor took charge of him as soon as the snow was brushed off. John was wearing a coat designed to be used in the highest mountains of Alaska, so the doctor took it from him and wrapped it around Raymond while John called for air support. Eventually, guided by ground flares, a helicopter landed and flew Raymond directly to the hospital. After he was rescued, they moved the remaining bodies to an area where they'd be less likely to be covered by snow. Then, they marked them with poles to be recovered later when the weather cleared so they could be returned to their families. Back in Edinburgh, the police had gone out to the parents' houses on Sunday afternoon, so the day before they were found, to tell them that the group was running behind. It wasn't until reporters showed up a little while later that they discovered that some of their children were missing in the mountains. This was a shock, not only because they were afraid for their kids' lives, but because the parents didn't even know their children would be hiking the plateau. As far as they knew, they signed forms to let the students go to the outdoor center and maybe walk around Laganley and back, but nothing like this. Before long, they were gathered at the school looking for answers. Tragically, on Monday afternoon, they were told that five of the students had died in the storm. In the aftermath of the disaster, the children's relatives did all they could to make sense of what had happened. There was, of course, an inquiry into what happened that began almost immediately. The cause of death was officially ruled as cold and exposure in every case, and to begin with, there was talk about banning schools from sending their students on expeditions in the Highlands. The ban wouldn't end up happening, but from then on, there was a set of rules recommended for any trip taken in the Cairngorms. There was also talk about whether or not all of the high-level shelters should be removed. Maybe more people might have survived, the less experienced group's only course of action was to turn back rather than continue on and look for the cure on shelter. Some people argued that the old shelters lower in the valley were perfectly safe and that only higher, potentially more dangerous ones should be taken down. Others argued that even the high shelters were better than nothing if you got caught out. 
In the end, it was decided that the shelters on top of the plateau should be dismantled, and while some survived, the Curran Bothy was demolished in 1975. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.